I know you do a lot with pain and it, I mean, pain, I know a lot of people are dealing with chronic pain. Um, obviously we have an opioid crisis, which Mm -hmm. is something we want to, um, pull away from. So talk to us about the power of hypnosis for pain and where you're seeing it in hospitals and, and, and work that you've done and, and why we're not seeing it more. Uh, the strain and pain lies mainly in the brain, Kelly. Um, you know, we have signals that come in from the periphery, but the brain decides what those signals mean. And um, uh, I think one reason we have the ability to modulate pain with hypnosis is that, you know, predators detect movement. And back in prehistory, we were, we were not very big. We're not very strong. We don't run that fast. One way we had to preserve ourselves if we were injured was to pretend we were dead, to just not move because predators look for movement and so we have a tremendous ability in our brain to to reprocess pain signals Mm. now right now you and your listeners you know are probably mostly sitting in a chair and until i mention it hopefully you weren't aware of the sensations in your body there if you were we can just stop now um but uh um we're very good at filtering in or out in sensation Uh, women have given birth throughout human prehistory and history without anesthesia and epidural blocks and all that stuff. Um, We can, you know, there's sort of good pain and bad pain. There's pain you need to know something about if you just broke your ankle um, to to get help. Or if you're having crushing substernal chest pain, get to an ER, don't treat the pain. You may be having a heart attack. On the other hand, uh, a lot of time we treat chronic pain as if it were acute pain. You know, you know that you hurt your arm three weeks ago and it's getting better and, you know, there's no point paying attention to it. So our brain is very good at, at uh, modulating the pain we experience. And in hypnosis, you can substantially alter and sometimes even eliminate uh, the perception of pain. I do it not by saying the pain will go away, but rather imagine your, 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 your arm that hurts is in uh, an icy mountain stream, feeling a sense of cool, tingling numbness, filter the hurt out of the pain. Um, and we found that, and other investigators have, that you actually turn down activity in the somatosensory cortex here, where we process pain signals and other sensory signals. If you tell people in hypnosis, well, let's try it a different way. The pain is there, but it it won't bother you that much because you know what it is. You know, it's getting better. Um, Don't worry about it. Um, The, the, you get analgesia then, but it's in the anterior cingulate cortex. You turn down activity there. So it's, you turn down your worry center because, you know, many of my cancer patients have found that, you know, they get a new chest pain. They think, oh my God, it's a new metastasis. You know, the cancer spreading and, we did a randomized trial with women with metastatic breast cancer, taught them this kind of self-hypnosis exercise once a week to practice at the end of a support group. And by the end of the year, they had half the pain that control group did on the same and very low amounts of medication. So it works not just acutely, but it works chronically too, because they would say, if I feel, start to feel the pain, I do my self-hypnosis and I felt better. You know, I just filtered the hurt out of the pain. So we know it works. We know that within a tenth of a second, the pain signals coming to the brain um, are reduced substantially when people are hypnotized. You just tell them cool tingling and numb. So it's not that you're later thinking, well, it wasn't that bad. It's that you're changing your brain's processing of the pain signals so that you feel less pain. And when you feel less pain, you most likely will heal faster because you're not in resistance, rigidity, or stress, right? Well, certainly that can be true, that you can allow your body to do its normal healing process without, you know, you immobilize a limb and uh, you get muscle wasting and um, it's harder to get it moving again. Uh, So certainly if you can use it appropriately without doing further harm, uh, it, it may heal more quickly, yes. Now, mental pain, depression, what have you seen with hypnosis and depression? Uh, it, 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 there are studies that show that it can be helpful with depression um, it, it, to the extent that you can let go of your old assumptions, that the, the, the views of, of who you are. And with depressed people, um, you know, you tell a depressed person nine good things about themselves and one bad thing, and what they remember is the bad thing. So if you can just kind of disconnect from your 
usual customary assumptions about yourself that can sometimes lighten the depression and allow you to take in positive feedback that you otherwise would would kind of filter mm -hmm. out you know it's sort of the converse of pain where you, you want to filter out the perception here you want to filter in the perception of, of things that might make you feel better um there's so there is some evidence uh that uh, hypnosis can be helpful there's a psychologist michael yapko who's written some very good books on hypnosis for depression uh it's very useful for for anxiety um it's uh uh, can help and and the way we treat anxiety is from the body up that is normally you know we think of psychotherapy as top down you know fix it in the brain first and the body will follow with anxiety we you know the way we often get anxious is you worry about something and then your body reacts to that your muscles tighten you start to sweat you know you breathe more rapidly and then and then you notice that you think oh my god this is really bad and then you get more anxious Sometimes, and then yeah. reacts. so it's like a snowball rolling downhill so we start from the bottom up from the body up so i have people imagine they're floating in a bath a lake a hot tub or floating in space um and just affiliate with the sense of physical comfort you get now you still haven't done anything about what's worrying you but you've already done something about the effect that the worry has on you so you're beginning to control part of it and then you can picture, for example, on an imaginary screen, something that's worrying you on one side of the screen and something you could do about it on the other. It doesn't mean the best or the only thing you could do, but just being in this more active position um, can often help you feel better. And uh, that's beginning, that, and that can be a very effective way of of treating uh, treating anxiety. So you wouldn't... Uh picture the thing that you're worried about happening a different way you would picture more empowerment of something that you could do about it yeah never... you, you could yeah i'm sorry go ahead you well yeah you... i mean but there's just there's so much that you, you know playing with imagination and, and imagining you know the icy so i i just i was curious of why you were empowering the the patient rather than um kind of diving them into a new visualization i know that like in hypnosis with trauma there's often a reframe like yeah. the, you know the, the feet were face down he was you most likely had the best outcome by walking away you saved yourself it was it was a helpless situation kind of thing yes um that's true um and and that's can be more complex i had a uh a lovely woman who who comes from a country that is not famous for treating women well and she uh, had gotten out finally to the United States and became a healthcare professional, but she retired early, was chronically depressed, kind of miserable. And I asked her about that early period. And she said, well, when I was 12 years old, I was raped by our landlord and my parents were afraid to do anything about it. They were afraid we'd be thrown out. And I began to realize as I walked around the streets that my body wasn't my own. Men could do or say anything they wanted, you know? And so she was chronically demoralized and uh, she was very hypnotizable. And I had, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture yourself as that 12 year old girl and kind of imagine you're your own mother. Um, and she starts to cry. And I said, I want you to picture her right after she was assaulted. And I said, is this her fault? And she shook her head. She said, no, no, she's a sweet, innocent girl. Uh, but many, many sexual assault survivors blame themselves for things they didn't control. We'd often rather feel guilty than helpless. And so inappropriate guilt is one of the things that keeps people trapped in, in mm. their reliving of the trauma. So uh, I said, well, what would you do if you were her mother? And, and she started crying again. She said, I'm stroking her hair. I'm stroking her hair. She's such a sweet little girl. And she came out of it she said she felt different she felt better somehow and she called me a week later and said uh dr spiegel my psychiatrist wants to know what you did to me because I, i'm not depressed anymore and my friends don't recognize me um, they say you're so happy and so there are times when you can use it to just uh, re reappraise, reset, and re-understand something that happened to you that has been causing chronic pain and help people deal with it better. So, uh, and again, it's this state of intense focus. She wasn't just remembering it. She was reliving 
that experience, but was able to see it from a different point of view and it made a big difference to her. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm. Life-saving. It's really like yes. liberating. Um, yeah. We have so many prisons in our mind and loops and, you know, stuckness. So this is such a Good. beautiful, beautiful um, modality. And and then let's just touch real quickly on phobias. Thank you for tolerating sure. me as I'm just, but I just think if no, sure, people sure. hear it. how it could help them with their specific thing. I know people with phobias of getting on an airplane. Right. Um, I have some sort of claustrophobia if I'm in a room that feels stagnant or if I feel that someone's on top of me and I can't, I can't like get fresh air. It must be like some past life trauma or something. Cause I don't know where it came from, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it might be too woo woo for you, but, no. um, but talk to me a little no. bit about phobia and how that, how that approach kind of differs. Uh, well, we, um, uh, you know, try to get people to, first of all, again, control the body. So, cause part of what happens with a phobia is you've, confront the phobic situation and the worst thing you can do with a phobia is avoid what you're afraid of because two things happen number one you're giving yourself a message that 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 dog or that bridge or whatever it is or that airplane is really dangerous because i'm staying away from it i mean it's a kind of reverse logic but that's how you know the brain is assessing your experience and saying well it must be bad because she's not going there um and the other thing is you don't build up a reservoir of positive associations so, you know, the view from the top of that building was really beautiful. I wasn't thinking about falling off it. Um, or the dog actually was kind of nice or, you know, who knows. Uh, I'll tell you a story. My, my father was treating a social worker in New York um, who had a terrible dog phobia. She would plan her leaving the apartment for times when she thought people wouldn't be out walking their dogs. And in midtown Manhattan, that's not it's easy. Never. It's never. <laughs> And she would just freak out and she she got so upset at a big fancy dinner her, her father, her her husband had arranged that she knocked over the table and there was food everywhere. And he said, you've got to get fixed. I can't stand this. Oh. So my father hypnotized her and had her say, um, um, picture um, a dog as uh, as potentially a friend, that there are dangers, there are wild animals and tame animals. And you make a decision whether this is one a wild type or a, or a tame type and and have a friend who you trust who has a dog bring it over and hold it and then go up and touch have an experience of actually touching the dog and she petted the dog finally and said dog friend dog friend and so she said thanks she felt much better and about six months later my father called for a follow-up he was unusual at that time and doing follow-ups on his patients and a boy answered the phone and he said, well, is, is your mommy there? And he said, um, uh, can I say who's calling? And um, he said, uh, Dr. Spiegel. And the boy said, well, that's funny. And my father said, what's funny? And the boy said, Spiegel's in heat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.